you will hear a woman, Paula, phoning her friend Ralph about an application to the local council for money for their drama club. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello, Ralph. It's Paula. Hi. You know I told you we could apply to the local council for money for our drama club. I've got the application form here, but we need to get it back to them by the end of the week. I could send it on to you. You really ought to fill it in as president of the club, but I don't know if it'll get to you in time. Well, you're the secretary, so I expect it's okay if you fill it in. Yeah, but I'd really like to check it together. Right, that's fine. Like the first part asks for the main contact person. Can I put you there? Sure. Right. So that's Ralph Pearson. Oh, and then I need your contact address. So that's two o three South Road, isn't it? No, two thirty. Oh, sorry, I always get that wrong. <laughs> then it's Drayton. Oh, do you think they need a postcode? Better put it, it's D R six eight A B. Uh、mm、huh. -hmm, okay. Telephone number. That's o one four five three five eight six o nine eight, isn't it? Yes. Right. Now, in the next part of the form, I have to give information about our group. So, name of group. That's easy. We're the community youth theatre group. But then I have to describe it. So, what sort of information do you think they want? Well. They need to know we're amateurs, not professional actors, and how many members we've got. What's that at present? Twenty. Eighteen. And should we put in the age range? That's thirteen to twenty-two. No, I don't think we need to. But we'd better put a bit about what we actually do. Something like members take part in drama activities. Activities and workshops. Okay. Right. That's all for that section, I think. You now have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now listen, and answer questions four to ten. Now the next bit is about the project itself, what we're applying for funding for. So first of all, they need to know how much money we want. The maximum's five hundred pounds. I think we agreed we'd ask for two fifty, didn't we? Okay. There's no point in asking for too much. We'll have less chance of getting it. Then we need to say what the project,、um, the activity is. Right. So we could write something like, to produce a short play for young children. Should we say it's interactive? Yes. Good idea. Right. I've got that. Then we have to say what we actually need the money for. Isn't that it? No. We have to give a breakdown of details. I think. Well, there's the scenery. But we're making that. We need to buy the materials, though.、Oh, okay. Then there's the costumes. Right. That's going to be at least fifty pounds. Okay. And what else? Oh, 
I just found out we have to have insurance. I don't think it'll cost much, but we need to get it organised. Yes, I'd forgotten about that. And we could be breaking the law if we don't have it. Good thing we've already got curtains in the hall. At least we don't have to worry about that. Hmm. We'll need some money for publicity. Otherwise, no one will know what we're doing. And then a bit of money for unexpected things that come up. Just put sundries at the end of the list. OK, fine. Now, the next thing they want to know is, if they give us the grant, how they'll be credited. What do they mean, credited? I think they mean how we'll let the public know that they funded us. They want people to know they've supported us. It looks good for them. Hmm. Well, we could say we'd announce it at the end of the play. We could make a speech or something. Uh, they might prefer to see something in writing. We'll be giving the audience a programme, won't we? So we could put an acknowledgement in that? Yeah, that's a better idea. OK, and the last thing they want to know is if we've approached any other organisations for funding and what the outcome was. Well, only National Youth Services. And they said that at present funds were not available for arts projects. Right, I'll put that. And then I think that's it. I'll get that in the post straight away. I really hope we get the money. I think we've got a pretty good chance. Hope so, anyway. Thanks for doing all this, Paula. That's OK. See you soon. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a student union officer explaining about the union's functions and services to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone. Now here you all are, new university students. And the first question you probably have is, what is a student union? Another question is, do I have to join? Well, regarding this second question, let me say that membership used to be compulsory in the past, but that did cause some controversy, particularly from students who wanted to remain free and unaffiliated, and this university responded, so joining up is no longer compulsory. It's totally up to you, although I'll admit there is a fairly strong obligation to join, since all students benefit from the large variety of services that we offer. We do understand, however, that many might be unwilling to join because of a supposed political slant to the union. Traditionally, student unions have been seen as being dominated by the left, and I suppose that's still true to a large extent. Here, however, at this university, our union discourages such one-sided viewpoints, and students across the whole political spectrum are welcome. Thus, if you feel that you are a conservative type, in other words, leaning to the right, you are particularly urged to join, to provide a more balanced representation. Now, let me move back to the first question. What are we? We are a formal organisation, but totally independent of the educational body. We make our own rules, rent our own premises, and organise ourselves as we wish. And our mission is basically to help you. For example, 
Do you remember how you all arrived in late February to have an orientation week? That gave you an invaluable induction into life here, right? Well, the student union organized all the festivities at the end of that. The barbecues, partying and drinking, and even the musical entertainment as well. We'll do that again on occasions, and as always, those events take place on the football ground. Now, do you have any questions before I move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, let me tell you more about the student union and its basic functions. In general, there are three, social, organisational and representational. Let's look at the first one. Basically, the union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear, in other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to 20% discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, there's a student union newspaper and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. All right, let's move on to our more serious functions, which are helping you get through life here, as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue, if you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example, perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym, then come to us. We have a range of counsellors and helpers, and even some lawyers, who you can meet in the conference room. So, just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles, and they'll be all ears. Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk on ocean spills. As you listen to the talk, circle the appropriate letter for questions 21 to 23. First, look at questions 21 to 23.
As you listen, answer the questions. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll talk about unusual ocean spills that have occurred in the world's oceans. In November of 1992, people at beaches in Canada and Alaska noticed something strange: blue turtles, red beavers, green frogs, and yellow ducks came bobbing toward them. They soon found out where the strange creatures were coming from. A ship from Hong Kong was on its way to Tacoma, Washington, when it was hit by a severe storm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. During the storm, huge waves washed twelve containers overboard. Inside the containers were twenty-nine thousand plastic bath toys. One of the containers opened, and thousands of plastic bath toys spilled out. And began to float across the Pacific Ocean. Ten months later, the first yellow ducks arrived on the North American shore. Beachcombers along the shore began to find the toys and reported them to local newspapers. But the people who were most excited by the plastic toys were the oceanographers. It gave them an opportunity to study ocean currents and winds. Before the conversation continues, look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Oceanographers drop bottles into the ocean to study these things, but it would be too expensive to drop twenty-nine thousand bottles into the ocean at once. Imagine the value of studying the plastic ducks and frogs. This gave some interesting information to the oceanographers. The first toys were picked up. In Sitka, Alaska, ten months after they were washed off the ship, some headed back into the North Pacific, while others drifted around the Arctic Ocean and headed for the North Atlantic. Many of the toys were swept northeast by the wind and were frozen in the ice of the Bering Sea. They're expected to cross the North Pole and float on down to the British Isles. This reminds me of another unusual ocean spill. In 1990, a ship traveling to the west coast of the United States from Korea was caught in a severe storm. The waves swept 21 containers of Nike shoes into the water. Scientists estimate that about 80,000 running, jogging, and hiking shoes, 40,000 pairs of shoes to you and me. Hit the water at once. The shoes were for men, women, and children. About six months later, people at beaches from Oregon to British Columbia began to find running shoes washed ashore. By the end of the year, Washington newspapers reported people finding hundreds of shoes. In Seattle, thousands of shoes floated to shore. Since the shoes were not attached, they arrived one at a time. The shoes were dirty, but after they were washed, they were still in good condition. People set up exchanges to find matches for their shoes. Oceanographers studied the information to learn more about the ocean. Some Nike shoes reached Hawaii; others went to the Philippines and Japan. According to the scientists, some of the shoes are on a trip around the world and should end up back in Washington. And Oregon, can you believe it? Many pairs of running shoes, as well as plastic ducks and frogs, are still on their ocean journey. So, if you go to a beach anywhere in the world, don't be surprised if you see a green plastic frog or a woman's size seven jogging shoe bobbing toward you. So keep your eyes out, so you may find free bath toys and even a new pair of shoes.
Thank you for attending my lecture. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on two famous American presidents. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln lived in different times and had very different family and educational backgrounds. Kennedy lived in the twentieth century, while Lincoln lived in the nineteenth century. Kennedy was born in nineteen seventeen, whereas Lincoln was born more than one hundred years earlier. In 1809, as for their family backgrounds, Kennedy came from a rich family, but Lincoln's family was not wealthy. Because Kennedy came from a wealthy family, he was able to attend expensive private schools. He graduated from Harvard University. Lincoln, on the other hand, had only one year of formal schooling. In spite of his lack of normal schooling, he became a well-known lawyer. He taught himself law by reading law books. Lincoln was, in other words, a self-educated man. In spite of these differences in Kennedy and Lincoln's backgrounds, some interesting similarities between the two men are evident. In fact, many books have been written about the strange coincidences in the lives of these two men. For example, take their political careers. Lincoln began his political career as a U.S. congressman. Similarly, Kennedy also began his political career as a congressman. Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1847. Kennedy was elected to the House in 1947. They went to the Congress just 100 years apart. Another interesting coincidence. Is that each man was elected president of the United States in a year ending with the number six zero? Lincoln was elected president in 1860, and Kennedy was elected in 1960. Furthermore, both men were president during years of civil unrest in the country. Lincoln was president during the American Civil War. During Kennedy's term of office. Civil unrest took the form of civil rights demonstrations. Another striking similarity between the two men was that, as you probably know, neither lived to complete his term in office. Lincoln and Kennedy were both assassinated while in office. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, after only one thousand days in office. Lincoln was assassinated in 1865. A few days after the end of the American Civil War, it's rather curious to note that both presidents were shot while they were sitting next to their wives. These are only a few examples of the uncanny and unusual similarities between the destinies of these two American men, who had a tremendous impact on the social and political life of the United States and. 
the imagination of the American people. That is the end of part four.